everybody. Uh, my name's Jackie, as has been announced, and I'm one of the pastors here. And so let me welcome folks who are watching online as well. May God speak to you, not what I say, but what does he say through this passage of scripture today? So we're continuing with our the series on discipleship. And today we're focusing on how is it possible to be resilient as a disciple of Jesus? And it's entitled, Hold on Tight. Hold on Tight is a description of what we perhaps need to do as we're journeying through life. I just thought we've had all these props up here for so many weeks. I'm a person who does like my visual aids. So I thought I'm gonna make the most of this. So here's our stick. When you go out walking, you need sometimes to have something to help you stay strong. And there are times in our life when we can walk along and it's just easy and the stick's just there just to kind of help us go along, but we're not that so bothered about it. But there are other times when, when the weights of life can suddenly feel pretty heavy and we need to really lean, lean on our stick, lean on the truth that we know as our followers, as we follow Jesus. I wonder for you today, as you come in, how weighted do you feel? How many bags do you feel you're carrying? Perhaps you're the striding out person today. There's parts of my week that have been really good and parts that have been not necessarily so good. My husband's headed off to Kenya. I shall let you decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, he's off on a mission trip. He works for a, a Wycliffe uh, Bible translators and so that he's out there on a conference and actually he's doing a good work out there. There's been other parts of my week that haven't been so easy. And for me currently, I have the responsibility of looking out for a mum who's about two hours away and I've now got to work out how often I go up and down to see her because she's not in such good health. So at times I have felt more heavy laden. But you come in today with all sorts of different aspects in your life. And we know that God wants to speak to people who are being real with him. And I believe that the passage today which is in 2 Corinthians, and it's talking, uh, Paul is talking to a church there, and just to give you a bit of background to it, so that when we read the passage, it makes sense. So he's writing to this church, and he's been challenged by them. Some of the people in the church have not been easy for him, because it seems that there's been some new teachers that have come along into this church. And whilst the um, Corinthians think they're great. And he calls them the super apostles because they are kind of coming in, looking great, speaking brilliantly, have great oratory skills. But Paul is saying they're selling you folks a cheap gospel. And it's not what's on the outside that counts. It's what is the truth that they are speaking that we need, he says, they need to be aware of. And Paul's hurt, actually. He's hurt and he's disappointed with them because their heads have been turned against what he had been teaching them previously. So he's saying, don't look at the flashy external because it doesn't get you very far. You can look great, but actually it matters more what's going on inside. What is the teaching that they're giving that is coming from them? So we'll pick this up in 2 Corinthians chapter four. I'm reading from the New Living Translation if you want to follow it word for word. Um, just because it felt to me that it made it easier to read and to draw the truths that I believe God wants us to hear today. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 5. So remember, this is Paul speaking via a letter to the people there in Corinth. He says, you see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. 
through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. We thank God that he gives us truth in his word. And now let me just pray that as I unpack this, God would speak to you. I thank you, God, that you have given us your scriptures because you want us to learn about you, to learn about ourselves, to learn about our world through them. And I want to pray that we will hear you speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what do we know about this man who's writing? Some of you would know an awful lot about Paul. Many of you would know he had a really dramatic conversion from being a hater of Christians, he was a Jew, he was absolutely fervently wanting people to understand what it meant to be a Jew and to live it right. But then he met Jesus in that dramatic moment on the Damascus Road, and he realized he had been so, so wrong. But then that passion that he had, which had previously been focused in one direction, had been moved completely, and now he is passionate to let people know who Jesus was, that Jesus was the Messiah, is the Messiah, that the Jewish nation had been looking for. But they had not understood that. But now he's got it. It's like nothing is going to stop him telling everybody he can who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. But the cost for him is huge. He, but it will not deter him. But when we read in chapter 11 some of the things Paul went through, we can be a bit in awe, I think, really. So let me just read chapter 11, picking up at verse 24. This is what Paul had to go through. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone often without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. <sighs> Who wants his life? Now, some of those situations were totally related to the fact that he kept speaking about Jesus. He would not be deterred from going forward to do what he knew God had told him to do. His greatest passion was for his fellow Jews because he so wanted them to understand what he now understood, which was a freedom. We've sung some hymns, songs this morning about we have freedom when we know God. He now was a Jew released from all the rules and regulations, and he'd understood the freedom that Jesus had come to give to him. And that's what he wanted to pass forward. That's why he kept talking to them. Now, maybe at this point, you're beginning to feel a bit small in your faith in comparison. I think when we read scriptures like that, we think, well, I'm never going to be like that. Because, but because God actually hasn't made us to be a poor. We have our own journeys in Chaffont St. Peter or Gerard's Cress or Beaconsfield or wherever you are, wherever you're watching online, we're not meant to be replicating exactly, but we are meant to be people who are passionate, people who actually understand the truth so that we are ready to pass it forward, which is what Paul was doing. We need to be people to know that we can hold on tight to how God views you. Maybe that's what one of the things we need to be thinking about. Hold on tight to how God views you this morning, because that can help you in whatever you're going through. 
If we compare ourselves with other people too much, so often I think we end up comparing ourselves with people who are above us. And then we can feel very small. What heroes in faith perhaps do you have? I, I guess because of my background within missionary work, I, I was formed by reading about other mission people. People like Amy Carmichael, who was a young woman who went out to India. Jackie Pullinger, who's still out there in Hong Kong, went out as a young Christian. People like Billy Graham, such oratory skill that could draw so many people. We look at these people and think, oh, wow. Or maybe not just a Billy Graham, but a Jim Graham. How many of us still look up to somebody like him and think, oh, he lived it right. But the problem with that is that we can end up feeling like we're some sort of worm in comparison. They're the big guys, we're the little ones. And that is not how God wants us to see ourselves. And there was a verse in Isaiah 47 that I just read in my Bible reading this week. And it gives hope to the little worm. Now, in this case, the worm was a nation, the nation of Jacob. But it says this to that nation. God says this to them. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob. I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. So what a comparison. He is saying, you know, the worm, it's delicate, it's vulnerable, it's easily crushed. But God is saying, yes, but I can hold you, little worm, and I can make you into something completely different. I can make you into a tool that has sharp teeth and can cut through rock. So with God's involvement in any of our lives, he can turn us from whatever we see of ourselves. Or maybe what we think other people see of ourselves and turn us into something completely different. Now, in this letter, Paul is talking about us being like jars of clay. Clay jars were containers, obviously, created by skilled potters. They were made out of raw clay. If you go to Unique Like You and you get raw clay, you can make it into something. And then it gets put in the oven to harden it off in the shape. And then it gets painted and glazed and decorated for whatever purpose that pot has. Now, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we are like those jars of clay, but we have a treasure inside us. So our bodies come in all shapes and sizes, and each one has been made by God to be useful. If you look at the people next to you, do they look like a good clay jar or a less than good clay jar? How do you judge each other? I brought along some more visual aids. So Paul was saying, those super apostles might be looking like this nice jar. It's nicely gold colored on the outside and it's got nice rim. Hi there, Michael. God bless you as you go. Thank you. Pray for you too. I'll pray later for you, Michael. I promise. And so we might want to be like this jar. But the thing is, this jar is actually a bit dirty-ish inside. And so he was challenging the people, don't be overawed by what looks so pretty on the outside, but recognize that you can be a bog standard, ordinary looking clay jar. I got this one from the garden center this week. Strangely enough, I went and tried to find the most boring pot I could possibly find. But the reality is he's saying we have light in us. And this is the best I could do to get light in that. We basically are people who have a tremendous treasure inside of us. But we need to know that we've got this treasure so that we can pass it around, so that we can talk about what it is that is this tre treasure that is within us. So it doesn't matter what our bodies may be looking like. We might think of ourselves as a cracked pot, or we might think of ourselves as too old. Some of you got it. Uh, some of, uh, you, but you might actually think, no, I'm looking okay. I'm quite elegant. But God is saying, don't bother so much with the outside. Of course, we need to look after our bodies. But matters more, are you aware of the treasure that is inside of you? The light of the gospel is what that treasure is. So what does that mean? Light obviously is in contrast to darkness. When we're dark, we can't see things. But when there's light, we can see it. So what's being illuminated? The whole message of what God has done for people in coming through Jesus there is personal salvation, and, and of course we don't want to undermine the wonderfulness of the, what it feels like individually to be made new, to be people who've been restored, a bit like the rubbish that we had, the fact that 
God takes the rubbish of us and turns us into something beautiful by being recycled. Thanks for that image. That was great, Helen. So we might think of ourselves as not very much, but God says, I've got you. And when I've got you, I reform you and I can make you into something completely different. This week, uh, on a Wednesday, we gather as a staff team and we're going through the Talking Jesus course. And this week it was, chap uh, it was session five. And it's giving some examples of testimonies of people. I love testimonies. I love it when we have baptisms and we hear people's stories of how they've been in rough places, hard places, difficult places, and then realized how Jesus has changed their lives. And there was one man who was interviewed, and uh, I just loved his story because it showed how God uses such ordinary things alongside such extraordinary things. So his story was about the fact that he'd come out of prison. And he was in prison, I think, because of drug-related crimes. And he was not a good one, if you like. But when he was in prison, he said, you get lots of time when you're in prison. And uh, he recognized, I presume they had some sort of Christians going in, that he needed to get his life right. And so he asked God to change him. And he seemed to be doing okay until he got out of prison. And then all the stuff of the world came back in and he started to sell cocaine again. And he realized his life was not what he wished it to be. And he was sitting at home one day and he felt dead inside. I think that was sort of the language he was using. And he said to God in his heart, in his head, but not out loud, God, please help me. And at that moment, his little boy who was sitting near him just suddenly said, peace at last, daddy. And this man was like, what? What? Because little boy said again, peace at last. He goes, what are you talking about? And the little boy was holding up a book that he actually wanted his daddy to read that was called Peace at Last. Now, what's, what's the timing of that? Oh, you could just say this little boy was just wanting a story read. But it was like, for that man, it was like God spoke through his son who was reading a book or wanted him to read the book to know that now he could have peace at last. That personal story, that sort of thing just makes me go, yeah, it's fantastic. We must never grow tired of seeing how amazing it is for our own salvation and therefore expect it for other people too. But there's so much more to the gospel message than that. It's not just about us as individuals. We live in such an individualistic society, we often only see it as an individual salvation. But there is so much more. And Paul talks about this in another of his letters. In Colossians, he says this, You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. I think we often forget that there's been a huge transition from deadness to life. You were dead. You were heading into an eternal abyss. You have life. You are heading into an eternal future with God. We need to remember this so that we don't grow tired and weary under the trials of our days. But then it goes on in verse 14. He canceled the record of the charges against us and he took it all away by nailing to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. We may not often think about this aspect of the gospel, but the whole spiritual realm was changed when Jesus broke the power of death. The curtain in the temple, which was a great visual illustration, when Jesus died, it says the curtain was torn in two from the top to the bottom. God had come and torn the curtain. And why was that divide there? It was because in one area was what's called the Holy of Holies. That was just where the priests could go. It was the special people. And outside that, there were all these different temple courtyards. And there were different courtyards for different types of people. But the tearing of the temple curtain meant that now there was free access for all the people to come into the presence of God. Not just the special, the Jews, but all people. You and me. But all the people in Chalfont St. Peter or the people in Mozambique or in Sudan or Kenya or wherever they are, they also have access, but we are people who are called to take that message to them. We sang about, may this glory go to the nations. We need to be people who are responding to that call, but it's also on our doorstep. 
the nations have come and we need to speak this message to them too. So this week we have the opportunity, as has been told, to be praying for our nation. Do you believe that your prayers change things? Now we'd all go, yes, of course we do. Yes, we do. Because that's what good Christians say. But the reality is they do. Jim Graham used to talk about the Exocet missile of prayer, that nobody can stop what your prayers are enabling to do. They go before the throne of God. They're like aroma, it describes, uh, uh, before the throne. And God loves to answer our prayers, but he needs us to be prayerful people. So if we're concerned for our nation, which I presume we are, because it seems to be in absolute chaos, we need to be people, whether or not we gather in a church room or not, who expect God to hear our prayers. We need to be people who have that fervency for our nation so that we can be enabled by him to be a part of what he wants to do to change our society. We have a part to play. So even in this small amount that I've just talked about in these scriptures, let me just remind us of what we've heard. We are given freedom from our wrongs. We are made truly alive. The debt of our wrongs has been paid. The evil spiritual forces have been disarmed. We have open access to God the Father. And we also have the promise of an eternal life with him. That, if you like, is the light in our clay jars. You are a message carrier. Because you have been changed and transformed, your clay pot is nothing. You don't need to worry about how you might feel about yourself or how others look at you. You are the carrier of this message. And for Paul, knowing that message meant he could hold on tight through some really tough, tough times. And so he could say, that he was afflicted in every way, but he was not crushed. He was perplexed, but not given to despair. He was persecuted, but not forsaken. He was struck down, but not destroyed. Paul held on to the truth of what God had put into him. He had met Jesus and that meeting of Jesus and his understanding of what Jesus had done changed the way he lived his life. Now, in many respects, Paul was unique, as I've said, but he is a representative of a man who went through so much. And because the gospel spread, we are now the recipients of that. But as you face trials, difficulties in your life, whether they're because you're a Christian or whether or not it's just a part of life, a bit like my mum getting older and needing extra care, do you believe that God cares about these things? Again, I'm sure you'd say, yes, you do. For me this week, as I was preparing, I have to say that sometimes I just have to smile at the verses that God gives as you're about to speak because they spoke so much into my situation. I was so encouraged as I read this and it's made me re-remember of all the gospel truth. And so I would want that to be your experience too because we can know for sure that trials come to Christians and the more we choose to step out and actually speak our values, which are different to our culture, the more you will get knocked about. Not just spiritually, but by people. If you talk about God in our society, that's maybe okay for many. If you talk about Jesus, suddenly you become somewhat more seemingly antagonistic. There is a spiritual reality that when we proclaim that Jesus is Lord of all, the, the spiritual forces of, of, of the darkness detest that but what we have learned through these passages is Jesus has broken the power of them and therefore we have the enabling to speak the name of Jesus into situations and into ourselves to help us on these trials in 1 Peter it says beloved don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings so we are needing to be people who can be encouraged by this word, encouraged by other people's lives, to know that he's going to help you, anybody watching online in whatever circumstance you're in. In our country today, it is, as I said, becoming more difficult to live out the values and not have repercussions. As I was preparing, I was looking on a, a legal site, which is there for Christians who are being taken to court because they have stood up in some ways for their, their practice. There's nurses, there were some who... 
uh, offered to pray with people in, in a hospital. Now, obviously, they've got to be really careful if they do that. But reality was that some people had complained about that, and then these nurses were stopped from practicing, although in many cases it was allowed that they could come back. I was reading about uh, a gynecologist who basically was because he refused uh, to be a part of abortion, that uh, it was getting impossible for him to come up the, the ladder. These are obvious sorts of situations, perhaps, where the values of the world and our values are so completely different. But what about ordinary things? Telling the truth, the whole truth, to people in situations, that's not always easy. We sometimes hold back a bit because we know if we say the whole truth, it's going to be more complicated. We need the wisdom to be able to know when to speak up. So whether you're in business or in school or in colleges or wherever you are, this passage challenges us to know the truth of who we are, know that it's good to hang on to that, but then we can be encouraged that he will walk with us through those trials, through those tribulations, so that when we are feeling weak, we remind ourselves of the full gospel message that is so much more but it's so glorious even as personal transformation. So hold on tight, my brothers and sisters, as you go out into your week. How God views you. What God has given to us through Jesus. And that through our difficulties like Paul, we can be overcomers. Let's just stop for a moment. Father, you know every person in this room and you know what they are carrying. You know how much they understand of this message. My prayer is that where people are feeling under heavy burdens, feeling like the recycle, unrecycled trash, that they would grasp hold of the truth of who they are before you. We can sing songs and sometimes those songs are nothing but words that come out of our mouths. But my prayer is that we will be people who sing songs, go out, speak truth, and be the people that you want us to be in our society. People who hold our heads up high, knowing that we carry a treasure. We carry you, Holy Spirit. We prayed, we sang earlier, may your glory fall in this room. Please, Holy Spirit, fall on us. Make us people who understand this. And if maybe we need to go away and learn more, then help us to learn more. But maybe we know so much already, but we still struggle and we're finding it hard to hold on. And help us as a body of people to support each other. Help us to be real with each other. That it's not weakness to have difficulties but it's strength to own them and to ask your help. So come amongst us and do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.